So today we're talking about the fundamentals of great design and the things that you nearly need to think about when you're producing your own designs for your marketing campaigns. And my word, have we got someone special for you today. He's not just a heavyweight graphic designer. He's a heavy metal weight graphic designer with no less than 18 years experience in commercial design. With over 30 to, well, over 27,000 subscribers to his YouTube channel, including me, he's known worldwide for absolutely rocking your brand. This true design genius has a passion for branding as big as his beard. So allow me to introduce you to Cole Gray of Pixels Inc. Welcome Cole, it's an honour to allow me to rock with you. Thanks Chris, what an intro. That didn't sound like me for a bit until you started talking about the beer. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks so much, very kind. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. So Cole, what we're doing today is that um, we're tapping into just a, a tiny smidgen of your vast experience in graphic design here. I've got some great questions that have been asked by our community of Rainmakers. So are, are you ready for these questions? Fire away, fire away. Fantastic. So first up, let's talk about logos, which can be a massive headache for many business owners. You've created some truly amazing logos, um, including ones for Discover Cooking, The Flavor Co, Macintosh Kitchens, Grow Accounting, Coffee and Co, and many, many, many more. But my favorite, and I believe it's yours too, is for your friend and client, Kev Anderson, which is so simple, but just conveys so much. So with that in mind, what, what basics do you go through to take an initial idea into a head turning logo that manages to say so much? Well, I think the first thing, the important thing for any business owner to remember is that uh, the logo is not for you, um, which some business owners struggle with because they're like, well, it's my business, it's my logo, you know, I have to, I have to love it, I have to, to like it. Um, it's kind of, the logo is there to uh, act as an identifier for your business and your brand, and it's there to sort of attract the attention of your ideal customers. So really, the logo is there to attract them rather than attract yourself. So you have to take yourself out of the equation. And that's a, that's a discussion I have to have with every business owner. And the question that I will ask a business owner when I come up with a logo design isn't, do you like this? The question I will ask them is, do we feel that this logo represents your brand? And that's an entirely different question, which will elicit a different response rather than, well, I don't like purple and I don't like triangles. It's like, well, if we're trying to give off a luxury feel, purple's a good color for that, you know, high end. And we'll, you know, probably touch on that later. Um, but I have four criteria for my logo designs. They need to be simple. They need to be appropriate. They need to be adaptable and they need to be distinctive. And I'll just kind of expand on that very quickly. So simple logos are often the most distinctive. If you think about the Nike swoosh, for example, that's a great example of a very simple logo. Um, if you try to throw everything, including the kitchen sink into your logo design to, to explain what you do, then it's just going to become messy and busy, especially at very small sizes. And that's where adaptability comes in, in that it has to be able to be reproduced at very small postage stamp sizes and also on a massive billboard, you know, and it needs to be clear and it needs to get across, you know, what you're trying to convey in your messaging. And that's where appropriateness comes in. So with appropriateness, you want to be using the right color. Again, we'll, we'll touch on color theory in a little bit and you want to be using the right typography. So you don't want to be using Comic Sans and a neon green if you're a funeral director. That's inappropriate. You know, you want to make sure that you're choosing the right uh, typefaces and the right colors that represent your industry or what it is that your, your service or product is conveying to the customer. And if you can follow simple, adaptable, and appropriate, then it will become memorable because it's got all of the right criteria 
to stick in people's brains. And that's the thing with a logo. It's not there to tell people what your business does. It's an identifier. It's there to help people catch a glimpse of it and have brand recall of an experience they may have had with your brand or an experience someone else they know has had with the brand and told them about you. So I worked with, or I bought something from this company. It was amazing. Customer service was great. And they tell you the name of the company and then you see the logo and you go, well, that's that company that my friend said was amazing. Now, one last point, and this is from the amazing, much better logo designer than me, Sagi Haviv. Um, he said that your um, logo in the beginning, when it's just created is an empty vessel. And over the years, of marketing, advertising, contact with customers and their experiences, you fill that vessel with all of that stuff and that builds meaning around the logo. So in the early days, don't expect your logo to do all of the work because you have to instill meaning into that logo. And over the years, it will start to mean things to people and they will connect with it more closely. When the Nike Swish was created in the late 70s, People didn't know that it meant sportswear, but now everyone does. And the only reason is because they filled it with meaning over the past four decades. It's very interesting what you say about, um, about busyness when it comes to logo. And it brings me on to the next question really, and that's about, um, about white space. And one of the, the many temptations for people that aren't natural designers, and I admit that I've done this myself many times, is to take an empty canvas ready for a design and fill every bit of white space with logos and texts and images and call outs until every square inch has got something in it. Surely though, white space is dead space and it, it, there's no harm in filling it, is there? Uh, you're trying to get value for money, aren't you? You want to make sure that you get, cram as much of your messaging into oh, yes. into that area as you can. Or if you know there's a, a bit of white space and my logo's over here, hey, stretch my logo. You know my logo's important. Fill all that space up. Why have you left that there? Um, white space is actually great to have because what it does is it lets people breathe when they're looking at something. It helps them to take in the message which is there. Um, it also allows for, you need hierarchy in design. You need, your eye needs to be able to read the most important thing, then the next important thing, and then, and so on and so on. If you cram a page full of pictures and text and logos and headlines and subheadlines all together, your eye just is lost and you don't know where to look. But by using white space, you can actually control how someone works their way through a page. And it doesn't necessarily have to be top to bottom. Um, I've got a video on my YouTube channel. You'll hear me say that a lot through this. Um, about <laughs> Good. white space with an example. And because of white space and hierarchy, you can actually have someone read the most important thing at the bottom, then jump to the top, and then go to the middle. And you can actually read someone's eye through using white space and careful placement of the things on there. Don't be tempted, you know, when, it is, when you hire a designer and they come back to you and <laughs> they've got lots of white space, they're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes and, <laughs> and, you know, make more money out of you by not designing something. They've actually designed it really well because they're trying to help you convey your message in the most succinct, clear way that they can by taking the viewer's eye around the page in the correct order of things. So, yeah. Fantastic. So, so let's say that uh, you've, got your, you've got your perfect canvas, so your perfect design, you've got lots of white space and it all flows really nice. But once people, and I've heard, I hear this quite a lot, once people have got an overall idea of um, what they're, they're including in the design, how it's laid out, they often struggle with typography, especially when it comes to choosing the right combination of fonts. Yeah. yeah. Have, have you got any uh, tips or advice on how to use fonts in a way that doesn't look as if the final design has been created by a six-year-old, maybe? Yeah. It, it... 
this is a there's a tough one on this interview because it's it's quite short and typography is a whole design field in itself. Um, we just need to remember that typefaces have personality and character. You know, the, the, it's like the logo design. A lot of things all relate to one another, especially in design about appropriateness. Um, and one of the one of the things I was watching um, a program the other day with my partner, and it was a history program, and they were in this little town. And it was a, a sign came up on screen and it was a warning sign and it was in Comic Sans. And I have no problem with Comic Sans. A lot of people, you know, designers like, oh, it's Comic Sans. But Comic Sans used in the right appropriate place for children's stuff or fun uh, events and fates is fine. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't use Comic Sans for an important message or a warning because it's not designed for that. It's designed to be kind of fun and welcoming. Um, so an understanding or a basic understanding of, of the different types of fonts and, and what they mean can be useful. Um, there are four basic font types. You can break them down into many, many ones, but the, there, there are serifs, which are more traditional looking. Uh, I think Times New Roman, which is I think is a basic uh, typeface on most computers. Um, and this gives a, a more classic look to things. Then you have a sans serif, which basically means it's fonts without the little decorative bits that you have on serifs. So they're more straight, which means they look a little bit more modern uh, in their use. So if, you know, if you're trying to be modern, then use a, a sans serif font. You've got script, which is like handwriting and you get all different styles of that. There's a big trend on Etsy and things like that for very brush script type, um, typography and then you have decorative and that kind of lumps in a lot of the the ones like could be grungy or horror you know with blood dripping around them they're more sort of designed uh, for that and I suppose I should touch on the difference between typeface and font they're used interchangeably by a lot of people and I am absolutely fine with that I will use the conversation with my client for what they think most people say font but technically a typeface like Helvetica or Times New Roman contains different weights of fonts. So a font is a specific weight inside a typeface family. Um, I've got a video on that if you want and a good analogy for that I'd say which makes it easy to remember. But generally in terms of design, if you're going to be designing something, I personally try to limit myself to two maximum of two different typefaces, maybe one for the headlines and one for the body copy. And there are lots of websites out there that if you type in uh, a typeface that you want to use, you say, um, let's say it's Helvetica. If you go into Google and say Helvetica font pairing, it will give you some examples of fonts which are, are typefaces which will actually work really well with Helvetica. And you can do that for any, and uh, that will give you a nice match. Sometimes it's good to have a sans serif and a serif as a match. And sometimes you can have the same, uh, the same typeface, but just use the different weights of fonts within that typeface to help you get a little bit of variety around the page. And variety is kind of key. You know, you want bolder for headlines and subheadlines, and you want um, lighter and smaller for your body copy. Again, it's about hierarchy and letting people kind of see what's important. Um, people, people tend to scan pages really quickly. So if you can help them scan the page and find the section that there is most useful to them, then do that and work with the typography. It's really difficult to fit this into kind of sound bites. Um, I want to talk about it in so much more depth, but hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, no, not at all. I mean, to be honest, there was a, I mean, I've been in marketing for what, uh, just over 20 years and there was a lot in there that I, I didn't know, especially I've always used uh, the word font and typography just interchangeably myself. So, you, you know, <laughs> I've, I've learned something today that's absolutely fantastic. So onto the subject of um, colour. So let's say that I own a business that's producing craft IPA beer. Yeah, I know you're a fan. Um, <laughs> and uh, as you know, they say that your choice of colour is incredibly important. But given that, who's to say that I can't use bright pink? Surely colour doesn't have that much of an influence on the perception of a brand, does it? 
uh, has a huge, huge influence on the brand, even though you may not personally think so. Um, when it comes to color, uh, I recommend that everyone, even just does a quick Google search on color psychology, and it will even just an image search, a Google image search, and it will bring up some uh, lots of images with colors, and it will tell you all the different psychology that color has, and it's subconscious. It's not really uh, felt initially. There are some colors, so people will relate blue to cold or red to hot, but then colors can also mean things that that are much more um, subconscious. Blue can also mean calm and professional, which is why every accountant under the sun uses blue and professional. I work with a lot of accountants um, through another agency who, whose niche is actually the only work with accountants. They're a creative agency for accountants. Um, and it's great working with them because they're all real people and they all have personalities and they want their brands to have personality. So we use color to help them break out of that, you know, cold and blue. And the thing is, there are, there's a huge spectrum of blue. It doesn't always have to be royal blue or navy blue. You know, you can have cyan and, you know, bluey greens and blue yellows. Um, it works really well. Um, or like I said, red can mean hot, but red also means passion and energy. Um, it can also mean anger. You know, it gives off different feelings and every color has that. Earlier on in the, our conversation, I mentioned purple. Purple tends to be used for creativity or when you have a high-end luxury item, purple will be used. Uh, I think Cadbury's chocolate uses purple to kind of give, you know, the feeling that they're you know, a top-end chocolate maker, even though in terms of how much cocoa's in their chocolate, it's probably, you know, at the low end. But by using purple, they circumvent that and make it feel like, you know, velvety and, and it just gives off that feeling. And so you will see that used in a lot of higher end brands. Going back to your craft beer, if I saw a craft beer can that was pink, then it wouldn't put me off the beer. It would actually, tr tr I, that would be the kind of would attract me because I'd be like, this is different. I want to, I want to check this out. And it would mean it was probably targeting a more youthful, I'm not youthful, but a more energetic kind of vibe to it, something different to really stand out on the shelf. For the craft beer industry, shelf appeal is a big thing, which is why you'll see many weird and wonderful designs because it needs to stand out. It's not your standard Heineken or Carlsberg or Beck's. Craft beer is very, very competitive. So you could use any color you want in that industry and it comes down to who you're targeting. It's the psychographics again, you know, what age group? male or female, male or female can kind of, you know, is neither here nor there in some instances for me, because, you know, we all like the same colors and things like that. But age groups is a good one. And, you know, are you trying to appeal to someone, you could be a craft beer company that's that are trying to appeal to people who like science fiction, you know, it's, so your cans are going to be colored, probably black and, you know, splashes of color for lasers and things. It, there's so many things you can do with color that will evoke a feeling. Even if you forgo photography and typography and just use color, you'll be able to evoke feeling in people. But you use color well with white space and typography um, and in your logo. Think about logo design as well and how color in your logo will, you know, really evoke a feeling. Mine's is red because I wanted to get the passion and the energy across in, in what I have, the feeling I have for design and branding. And, you know, a big fan of black as well. And that comes from my, from the heavy metal, uh, my heavy metal background. You know, I used to have really, really long hair. Uh, I don't have any, um, that's a sign of age, but you know, at least the black I can hold on to. And the, the, the red and black gives off a very strong, confident vibe and that's what I wanted but you may be for example uh, a logo designer that wants to work with uh, hairdressers so maybe you you would you would design a, a brand for your agency that was more pastel colors or you know more calming more neutral because that's how a lot of the salons are branded so by making your brand as a designer in line with the niche you're targeting then 
you will have a better instant connection. The, the salon people who are looking for designers are looking around, oh, I like that. I like their colors are kind of aligned with ours. I like that. I'm going to have a conversation with them. Whereas I'm looking to work with people who want to rock their brand and, you know, get over a strong message and, and have confidence in their branding. And so I wanted a weighty, strong feel. Um, and the same with my type. You know, it's a strong, bold, heavy, um, it's called Fat Frank. Um, is the is the typeface that I'm using. You know, so there's a lot of meaning behind it, uh, even though on the surface, it's just colors and words. Yeah. But subconsciously, it's having an effect on people. Um, and so you can do a lot with color. Get the color wrong, and you can, you know, it can have a disastrous effect depending on, on where you're in. So for example, if you make food, if it's a food product, you probably don't want to use blue. There's not many blue foods out there. Um, so, you know, there's you can go deep you can go very deep on this but again hopefully that's you know a good overview and i have videos on that on my channel <laughs> good. okay so that's brilliant cole thank you um now let's talk about timeless design now you became hooked on design thanks to your love of american superhero comic books and those designs still look as good today as they did a century ago. And it's the same with the Coca-Cola bottle, which is often claimed to be one of the world's best examples of timeless design. What is it about some designs that just don't age? You know what? I don't know if there's a secret to that or, or, or not. Um, I mean, I love the Coca-Cola bottle. Um, I think it's it's perfect, and I loved the. Uh, I remember reading about the the brief that was given to the guy to design that, and it was a bottle which a person could recognise even in the dark. And I thought that was such a great thing to have. And and if you imagine the Coke bottle and how it feels, you know, I thought that's a, what a brilliant brief that is. And so I suppose you know what makes it timeless is it. Is it, you know, if you could feel it in the dark, could you understand where it is? Because I suppose another classic is the, is the Mini Cooper. Mm. You know, if, if you could feel a car in the dark, you would probably know what a Mini Cooper was like. Um, or, a, you know, the, like the Swiss Army knife, you know, you'd be able... So, I mean, I'm just <laughs> like riffing on that, but I'm trying to think yeah. of all the things that I think are classic in terms of product design. Um, obviously, if it was like flat on the page, you, you, you can't tell. But from product design, it's, they tend to be tactile um, in a way. You know, the Coke bottle, even the, the Mini Cooper has, you know, well, the original ones had those straps on the bonnet to hold the straps down. But then yeah. they're such a rounded shape. I've got a, a BMW uh, Mini. You know, it's not quite the original from the 60s, you know in there it's a bit bigger and i i prefer the comfort of the newer ones um but i've always wanted one again because i've always thought they're great shapes but i don't know there's something about that brief that was given to that that company to design the coca-cola bottle about people should be able to tell where it is even in the dark you know i think what's, there's another one as well there's a there's a famous kind of uh is it uh no it's a, i think it's a lemon juicer um, and it's like really tall. I can't remember the name of the designer. But oh, it's I know what you're thinking it's of. It's yeah. really tall legs, you know, and that's a, yeah. a design classic as well. And again, I could imagine feeling that in the dark and knowing what that is. So that's probably not a very scientific answer to, you know, timeless design. But uh, I'm going to stick with uh, if you can feel it in the dark. I, I love it. I, I, I think that's a fantastic way. I think that really does sum up um, timeless design. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, in terms of timeless designs and, and just overall d design themselves, not everyone's got the skills to do it themselves. And I find that a lot of business owners are putting their hands up and admitting that even with the likes of Canva helping them out, design just isn't their kettle of fish. And no matter whatever they do, they just cannot come up with the right kind of uh, design. So they admit that they do need to get in the professionals. 
So what do those people need to prepare when approaching a design agency like Pixels Inc to make sure that you end up rocking their brand? And the first thing is to have a, have a clear goal. What is it that you're trying to achieve? You know, is it to get more customers? Is it to get more uh, people on your website? Is it to get more social media likes? Because by giving a designer a goal, then there's different routes and pathways to doing things. So that's very clear because sometimes, you know, the, uh, a customer will come to me or a client will come to me and they, they don't know, you know, it's like, oh, we need, or they will come and say, we need a new, we need a new logo. And I'll ask, why do you need a new logo? Well, we're, you know, we're not getting many customers and we think that the logo is, you know, not working for us. And it's like, okay, well, it's probably not your logo. Your logo seems fine. Let's take a look at your, your marketing materials or let's take a look at your website and then we'll find, you know, through looking that, well, actually your marketing materials aren't very clear. They're not very persuasive. Um, they're very generic. You know, you're, there's no call to action on here. And so that would, that would help if you, if you have an understanding or if you don't know why, then just say, it's much better to be honest and say, we're, we're just wanting to get more customers. We don't know why. Then you can have a discussion. If you say to the designer, we want this because we know that this is, you know, the thing that will help us. If you go down that route, the designer will, will take your lead on that because you know your business better than they do. But then you may find that it's the wrong way to go and a lot of time has been wasted. So try to be as open as possible with the designer. Um, in terms of hiring the right designer, then you want to look at, if possible, if they've got case studies on their website. Uh, testimonials are great, but you know, they don't really tell you a lot about how that designer works with a client. Good case studies will show their process and how they work through things. Uh, are they problem solvers or are they just order takers? Uh, there are many different types of designers. I'm definitely not an order taker. Uh, I like to think of myself as a problem solver. So I will listen to the client and then we will look at different ways of doing things. And I mean no disrespect to any client, but often what the client wants isn't what the client needs. And so it's my job to make sure that I give the client what they need rather than what they want, because they could be spending money with me and not really getting the results that they deserve. And so by listening and understanding them a lot more, I can give them a good return on the investment that they, that they spend with me. Um, if they don't have any case studies, but you like their work, ask them about their process. You know, do they have a strong process? What happens at this stage? What if you don't like it? What if something happens? You know, you need to know all of these things to get a good sense of trust uh, with the designer. You want to make sure that they're going to do the right, they're going to do right by you um, as much as, uh, you know, you do right by them by becoming one of their customers. And for me, um, I do this a lot when I'm looking for new suppliers and stuff. I ask if I can speak to one of their existing or two of their existing clients. Um, and if they're doing a good job with these clients and they should be more than happy, you know, and the clients are obviously okay with it, then they should be fine with that. And I've got many clients that, you know, are, are I've asked them in advance, you know, if, if I have someone who needs, you know, to speak to an existing client, are you cool to do that? Um, then most will be okay with that. Um, so those are sort of some key criteria to, you know, a good relationship with a designer. So hopefully that will help you um, if you do kind of get a bit stuck with Canva and you need just that little bit more um, expert help to push things forward for you. I love the way that you said um, that the the, um, the client gets what they need and not what they want because so often a client will have some kind of expectation when they um, and, and that they, they will want certain things done their way but it's clear that you're going out of your way to actually um, achieve what they need to achieve for their business and not what they want to achieve for themselves so that that's absolutely fantastic. And finally, Cole, are you ready for our quickfire quiz to find out which of the following brands you believe would win a battle of the brands? Well, let's go for it. We'll see. 
Okay, right then, let's go for it. Burger King or McDonald's? Um, so it depends on the criteria, but I would say from brand recognition, McDonald's. MasterCard or Visa? Uh, MasterCard. Mercedes Benz or BMW? BMW. You'll like this one. Brew Dog or Longhorn? And that, remember, this is about brand, not taste. <laughs> Um, I think BrewDog speaks uh, more closely to me. Coca-Cola or Pepsi? Coca-Cola for their branding. I prefer Pepsi as a drink. Okay. <laughs> Chanel or Gucci? Oh, I'm no fashion expert. Um, but the, this, I'm this, sure this, the this Chanel and Gucci are pretty similar, aren't they? They're like two C's, or a, a G and a C and a, a C and... Two. Gucci because I see you know bags and things all over the place. Cadbury or Nestle? What was the first? Oh, uh, Cadbury. Cadbury. Lidl or Aldi? Oh, again, they're so close, and I shop in both. Um, I will, and and their advertising is so good as well because they've got this real great tongue-in-cheek thing. I'm kind of a bit like they're almost like the brew dog of supermarkets. Um, they've got this like anti-establishment thing or oh, you know what i i can't separate those two okay <laughs> heinz or hellman's and remember this is all about brand the, the the brand image hellman's lego or meccano uh lego microsoft or apple uh i'm a big apple fan so I, yeah <laughs> apple Virgin, Virgin Atlantic or British Airways? British Airways, classic. Primark or H&M? Again, we're in, you know, okay, this is low-end fashion, but uh, Primark, probably. And final one, TikTok or WhatsApp? This is an old man talking about social media. <laughs> um, in terms of brand awareness and, uh, and punch, uh, TikTok. Fantastic. Okay, well, that's brilliant. That's the, um, the, the quick fire quiz. So, Cole, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. The advice that you've given will be a massive, massive help to so many business owners who often do struggle to convert um, an idea into something that does resonate with the target market. And now for all you fellow rainmakers out there who want to enhance your design and branding skills, Cole has put together Rock Your Brand. Rock Your Brand sends you monthly brand strategy techniques, guidance, reviews of the best brand related books, apps, software, productivity tips, the lot to help you rock your brand. And you get it on the first Monday of each month. Here's the website address. So please sign up. And for anyone wanting to chat with Cole to discuss what Pixel Inc, sorry, Pixels Inc can do for your brand, I'll give you all the details below, as well as how to subscribe to Cole's YouTube channel. Cole, again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with the Rainmakers. And I wish you and your team at Pixels Inc a very Merry Christmas and I hope 2021 absolutely rocks your world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris.